Okay, so um, today I'm going to show you what the uh, CI architecture, software architecture looks like today. Um, and when I specify software architecture, we not mean like an infrastructure side, uh, but we'll see at software components. And um, I'm trying to simplify a lot the concepts without going too much in details, uh, because otherwise we will um, dilute too much the, 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 the purpose of this talk. But if you feel like you want to know a little bit more in details, uh, we can dive in details or we can even follow up uh, asynchronously. But um, yeah, so the, the main goal is to give you an overview of what CI architecture looks like. So for that, I've, um, I've prepared, uh, okay, so I prepared this diagram here. Can anybody see the diagram? Okay. So, and after that, I'll be sharing this. Um, probably what I'm thinking is I'll, uh, if there is any feedback about this specific, we can, uh, I'll integrate some feedback and then uh, we can, um, we, we can definitely uh, improve it and put it on a documentation page. Uh, I have some ideas where this could go in our dev documentation page, but uh, uh, and I guess this is kind of a, a light document as well, so we can keep improving it over time. Um, so uh, we can start from the uh, left hand side. So on the left hand side, we have the user and the automation it can be a human being and, and that is um, can trigger various uh, can trigger pipeline based on, on uh, based on various uh, type of triggers. So uh, I've indicated here the the, the one we have from kind of the most important one to uh, the least uh, famous. Uh, but so the Git push is definitely one of the, the events, most popular events that triggers pipelines. Uh, but also when you when you use the API or the web UI, clicking a button to run a pipeline, when a merge request is created or updated, uh, a pipeline is also uh, created. And um, merge train is another feature that can trigger pipelines. Uh, or you can have pipelines set up with a cron job uh, schedule and, and that is triggered at the right time. Um, you can also subscribe, have a project that subscribes to, a, to a, another project. And whenever a pipeline completes for that upstream project, then a, a pipeline is also created to the downstream project. And uh, there's also change when every time you make changes to CI CD settings, all the devops can also kick in and, and create a pipeline. Um, we have a similar feature to what we currently have with merge requests that also work on GitHub pull request events. So if you have GitHub connected um, with GitLab and for CI CD uh, as a external ex repo, so anytime you change the, the pull request or by updating the code, uh, it also triggers a pipeline for pull request events. And last last point I'll actually last trigger I'm gonna talk throughout the, the, the workflow. But so these are some of the triggers that we have uh, as of today for uh, creating a pipeline. If I'm, I'm if I'm forget any of them please let me know and I will uh, add it later. Uh, but basically um, so in order to create a pipeline, we have the create pipeline service. Uh, okay, so and this service um, works very closely with uh, what we have our DSL and um, and the linter, so which is the the YAML processor. Uh, and there's a lot of logic in the YAML processor. It's basically where we define our YAML syntax, any new keywords and new behavior that we want to change uh, is defined in this DSL and also provides a, a linter with giving you uh, error um, um, in case of any syntax error or any semantics, uh, semantic er errors. Um, and basically, so the create pipeline uh, service relies on, on this service. And the outcome is uh, is a pipeline being per uh, persisted into our database. So here I'm abstracting a little bit this pipeline data. Just you know, this can include pipeline, the build, the stages, uh, artifacts, basically anything related to pipeline. Just I'm simplifying this this concept. Um, and and you can see that the dot lines are basically data flow uh, within writes and the. The straight line is the process flow. So you can see create pipeline service persisted the, the, the pipeline data. 
And as soon as it finishes, immediately calls the process pipeline service. Process pipeline service is actually our core, um, core domain service. And this is being uh, continuously uh, run throughout the pipeline lifecycle. So what this service does is it gets an input a pipeline and uh, is this responsibility is to move each of the jobs to the next stage. Uh, so it tries to take jobs there, uh, all the jobs in a pipeline uh, as soon as it's created are in a created state. So the purpose of process pipeline itself is to move them up to completion. Uh, so that means anything is in created state, uh, Process pipeline service figures out what are the jobs that can run first. So for example, in a stage approach, all the jobs in the first stage are transitioned into a pending state um, and etc. So it keeps moving jobs to, uh, until uh, all the whole pipeline is completed. Um, and when jobs transition in a pending state, uh, this is a particular state because it's what the runner uh, can actually see. And uh, it, which means like a job is being queued uh, for the run to be picked up. So if we jump on the other side of the diagram, so we have our pool of uh, runners. This can be runners, can be uh, shared runners, group runners, or project runners. Uh, you can have runners, they have specific tags, that, which means can, they can pick up specific jobs that match the same tags. Uh, but basically here, right now, I'm not making a distinction between shared uh, group and project uh, runners, but let's consider we have a pool of runners. Um, so the runners interact with our Rails um, server through these, what I call the runner API gateway. And it's basically a set of operations that are dedicated for the, for the runner to use. Uh, there is like a registering runner, delete runner, and verify runner, and these are um, operations that interacted really with, with the runner's uh, instances so they are saved in, in the database. Um, but uh, as soon as the runner is connected, uh, it keeps requesting for jobs. Um, and it's basically, so through this um, uh, API endpoint, uh, basically tries to contact the rail server asking for, for, for new jobs. And whenever uh, a runner connects to, with the rails, so again, here there is a bit of um, simplification in this, in this point, because in reality, we have workhorse that intersect these connections. And my, if there is no uh, available jobs for this specific run that is conducting the server, uh, we, the workhorse will intercept the connection and immediately returns uh, a response. So the connection doesn't reach the, the rail side. But this is a kind of a simplification. So um, whenever a runner connects to, to the rail side, um, we run the registered job service. So this registered job service looks at the database and, and basically uh, its purpose is to look at all the jobs that can be assigned to this runner. So start large and slow uh, and by using a set of queries, narrows down the search uh, to uh, a list of jobs that can be uh, assigned to a runner and eventually picks up one. Um, so for example, if, if it's a project runner and requesting a job, it looks at all the jobs from that specific project, and then looks at what uh, if, the, if there is any tags, what tags are, can be matched, and and then picks up the first job in that case. Uh, there is also in this specific case on GitLab.com, we also take in consideration the the minutes that um, specific group uh, has been using. So uh, there's a certain bandwidth of, of minutes that are allowed for, for a specific month. If there is no more minutes available, then register, register job service simply discard that, that job. That's why the customers sometimes might see, if, if you run out of minutes, you don't see any more jobs being scheduled. That's because they are filtered out at this point. Um, so the registered job service then eventually what it does, it takes uh, the, f the first job that could match all these criteria, assign it to the to the runner and return basically that as a, as a response to the runner. The runner at this point has all the information to run the job and does the, the execution. But as soon as the job is assigned, uh, we are updating the, uh, the job from, from created, so, so for, sorry, from pending to running. And, 
And, and again, any jobs uh, status updates um, triggers the process pipeline service. Because something has changed in the pipeline, now the process pipeline service is triggered again, and its job is again to take all the remaining jobs that are there and, and figure out which one can now be uh, transitioned into pending stage uh, and, and, and move on. Or uh, let's say all the jobs in a specific stage I've completed, uh, can this stage now trans turn into past or fail? And eventually until the pipeline is, is completed as well. And so you can see any status updates trigger the process pipeline services as well as um, uh, other interaction, external interactions. Uh, so imagine a user wants to retry a pipeline or even cancel a pipeline or wants to retry a job or play a manual job. Because this triggers a status update, again, the process pipeline service is retrieved and, 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 and run basically until the, the end of, of the pipeline. Um, so we were at the runner while the runner was executing the job. And um, as the job is being executed, the runner wants to update or append some blocks, for example. So uh, as the sub blocks are generated, it sends back continuously. And those are um, received and processed. Um, they can be saved in, in the object storage, then they can be then exposed um, in the UI and parsed. And as well as um, when the job completes, then the runner will use the updated job uh, endpoint, uh, which it does exactly what it says. So updates the status of the job, which again triggers the process pipeline service. And this is again another loop. Um, another thing is throughout the the, um, the life cycle of the job uh, being executed by uh, by the runner, there there could be uh, some artifacts being uploaded or downloaded. So if the job generates artifacts that the user specifies in the configuration to be uploaded, then those gets uploaded and saved in the object storage. And also some metadata information is saved into the pipeline database. Um, and there can also be some test reports and other types of reports that have been generated from, from the artifacts. Uh, as well as artifacts that are downloaded by the runner. So if you generate some artifacts in one job, and then down the line, you have another job that needs those artifacts, uh, then those will be able to be downloaded by the runner. And so this is kind of artifacts of, um, sent and, and received. Um, and then as I said, there is a lot of um, information that we actually parse out of test reports and visualize differently. This is more like what the group testing does. Um, but all this information is saved, and, uh, both metadata and, as well as the actual uh, uh, data of, of the, the, the reports. Um, finally, uh, there is another part. So as I said earlier, so when a job transition into pending stage, it's basically being enqueued for the runner uh, to be picked up. Um, there's another special type of jobs that we have, which is the bridge job. And it's those jobs that we use either you know, with a trigger syntax to um, generate a pipeline, a downstream pipeline. Those type of jobs, they still run when they are uh, transitioning the pending stage, um, but they, they run server side. They are not actually sent to the runner to be executed there. So it's something we do internally, and that's why it's sort of a special type of job. So when this job, the job trans uh, transition into a pending state, we this becomes a pipeline trigger, and which is used by the create cross project pipeline service. That's currently how it's called today. But I think it needs to be renamed into something more downstream pipeline since this is now being used also for a child pipeline uh, creation. Um, and this basically creates a downstream pipeline, which triggers again the whole process back. Uh, the pipeline is created using the YAML processor and sent back to the process pipeline service. Um, this is, in a nutshell, is basically what is what happens, uh, like uh, the, the life cycle of, of a pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of information here left out, especially what do we do with artifacts? How do we manage artifacts? We have, for example, a lot of types of artifacts, and there are also some of them feeding into test reports. Some of them are used for a few different purposes, like uh, job logs. 
these artifacts can expire and we have mechanisms to expire artifacts to even delete them after a while. Um, so there is a, some kind of details left out, but this, for, this is the purpose of just to make it extremely simplified. Um, any question? I have a question. Um, <clears throat> one, great, great job on the graph. It's a lot easier to visualize architecture Not versus okay. fumbling around through the code base. So awesome job. Um, I was wondering, so like on the, after a pipeline trigger happens and we have to create pipeline service. So the YAML processor, does it just pretty much look for a, a set of defined keywords to feed to the pipeline service that which uh, in turn writes to the pipeline database? Are you saying so what sort of uh, configuration are being used? Yeah, correct. So like if I have a certain keyword like uh, trigger or stage, um, does that processor kind of feed that in a certain data structure to the pipeline service, which does various things and then writes that configuration to the database or creates a data structure of a pipeline? Yes. So the create pipeline service provides basically it, it lays on top of this yaml processor and provides some information about um where the configuration is for for this pipeline to be created uh, this could be an example uh, so this information is provided to the um so by the create pipeline service that it then is extracts what is the yaml file uh, or the, the yaml string let's call it contact uh, that needs to be used to create a pipeline. And this is fed into the YAML processor. So the create pipeline service, depending on how you are creating a pipeline, it knows, for example, uh, as, a, as a set of rules of where to find the YAML file. Let's start from this. So uh, the normal scenario is the GitLab CI YAML file is in the repository. And then, so this is the default scenario. But you might change the path of that file to be a custom path. So in that case, if the YAML file is not there, then it looks for the custom path. Um, or there could be other situations where um, the, the way we create a downstream pipeline, for example, the YAML file, it's not something that it is um, the default, let's say the GitLab YAML file but that we use when we create a child pipeline, but it is dictated by what is in the include. So for in a child pipeline, you use trigger include a set of uh, files or, or snippet. Uh, that, this is the actual YAML file that is then passed into the YAML processor. The YAML processor uh, extracts basically all the, to transform basically the, the, the rules that you specify in the YAML format into a data structure that is then persisted. And there can be a bit of factories there like uh, to actually uh, make everything consistent and um, this data structure consistent once it's persisted then it's the process pipeline service is involved uh, but yeah so the, the the responsibility of the yaml processor is to to transform a yaml file into data structure so i'm assuming we have <clears throat> some sort of pipeline model on the back end and it just writes directly to that with key value pairs it's, yeah, so you can imagine that the YAML processor, what it does is uh, it generates a big hash of configuration There is that is normalized. So, you know, if you do, I want to include these files and this other file, or I want to extend this job with this uh, snippet here. So it will norm, uh, denormalize the whole data structure. Mm -hmm. And it also will do that in... Uh, it, so if you say you want to include a look at remote uh, configuration, it will go and collect that and also merge everything. So it will merge everything and it will do some validation whether that type of job that you are building does have the correct configuration, otherwise it will return immediately an error. But assuming everything is fine, you get back a big hash of, uh, of data structure. Uh, that is not the data structure that is exactly persisted uh, but then this is returned back to the create pipeline service. The create pipeline service knows how to break down this hash and actually mm -hmm. save in uh, persist that in different tables, uh, so in different models. In that case, in that case. 
So we'll extract all the jobs. We'll go into the the jobs uh, um, uh, table. All the stages. We'll go into the stages table. Then we'll create a pipeline that also has all the jobs and um, linked with foreign keys. It basically does all this on time. Um, but the pipeline, the YAML processor doesn't know anything about how this data is being persisted. Right. Its only job is to pretty much process the YAML. Yes, so okay. this is where we define the DSL, which is like how you want each keyword to, to behave, mm -hmm. and the final linter, which returns any errors or the uh, validated data structure. Okay, and the other question I had was, um, so based on the graph, I'm, I'm sure we have tons and tons of writes to the pipeline database uh, or this specific table, I'm guessing that's represented uh, by pipeline data. Is that, a, is that a table or is it a separate database? No, um, this is just like, I, I think I might rename this a little bit because um, I, I want to abstract the, a little bit. Just basically a database where there's different tables. I call it pipeline data because they actually are related to pipeline, but there could be different tables like stages and, and builds and artifacts. There could be all separate tables. Gotcha. Just simplify so there. Okay, I got you. Um, I was just curious, are we handling all of that in one database for like pipelines or do we have several databases that we're spreading out the load across or how does that work? So we have one t a table for pipeline, a table for builds um, underneath. I, I, I'm, I believe we have a um, uh, way of parallelizing the connections. We do have query parallels. I don't know the details of that, uh, but if anybody else in the call has some details of it, please jump in there. Uh, but I know we will have a way of parallelizing connection to the database. Um, but right now, is everything goes in big tables. I think there's discussion about breaking down and doing some some partitioning uh, as of today. Gotcha. So I'm guessing, like on a day-to-day -day basis, back end kind of always has to think about how much we're interacting with the database and how many writes we're doing per second type deal, or is that something that the database engineers consider? Well, we do have to consider uh, scenarios like, um, for example, the pipeline table and especially the build table, they're quite big, uh, not only in terms of rows, but also in terms of uh, columns. Uh, so there's a lot of information there, a lot of data, and. And this is something that we have to definitely keep in consideration anytime we want to make changes to the, that schema, because either it requires a migration that might long, run for a very long time. And we actually have seen some scenarios where we're starting to, to, to kind of, uh, let's say, like, find some sort of roadblock there because of the, the size of the database. So we can't run certain migration, for example. Uh, we have to come up with a different sort of creative solution that goes, works around that. Or, um, so basically, this is the kind of the situations, uh, problems that we have. Thank you. Yeah, you asked if we have a single database. We use a thing called PG Bouncer, which is basically a connection pooler. Uh, to the back end, it appears to be a single database, so we only query a single database. But uh, deeper down, PG Bouncer actually has multiple instances of, well, replicas of the database. Uh, one of them is the master, and the other ones are slaves. Uh, all of the slaves are read only, and PG Bouncer actually pulls the connection, and it has internal logic in terms of like, Hey, I'm going to direct your request to one of the replicas that has like the betting on the load. Uh, so it's spread out, spread out, but it's um, to as far as implementation is concerned, we just don't think about it. Nice. So that's uh, I'm assuming BG Bouncer is some sort of load balancer, like for servers, but for databases. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Um, I had a quick question. Um, so you mentioned that there is a there's like a runner queue that sits, I guess, in front of the set of runners. Uh, so we don't really have a runner queue. We sort of simulate that uh, behavior. Uh, what we do is um, the register job service 
is um, it, it looks at a database and looks at what jobs are in a pending state and uh, and choose some of them using some specific algorithm that like a, a fair um, um, approach algorithm in a way that doesn't um, it, it gives preference to to projects that have l a lower number of builds in pending state. So to avoid that something a project that is very busy takes most of the runners, especially in a shared environment. And um, so use a specific algorithm, but looks at basically at what we have in the database, uh, data structure in the database, and picks up a job and then assign to the room. And the discussion we were having earlier about the CI/CD demo. Uh, Dragos can talk about that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a different approach where we want to sort of introduce more uh, an actual queuing mechanism um, or, or behavior similar to, to a queuing mechanism. But right now it's more a polling approach. So the runner keeps asking for, for jobs uh, until there is some jobs that are actually can be assigned uh, to this runner. Uh, but it's basically an eager um, implementation where yeah, we have all these runners that are always connected and always asking for jobs. Cool, thanks. I have a, a question more about um, user interaction in the middle of pipelines. So let's say that um, you're, there's, a pipe, there's a couple of pipeline running or there's one pipeline running and a user cancel, let's say, the, like the pipeline. Um, how do we How do we make sure that we're still generating, because for example, the test report, like do we still generate like a report for what has been run or do we kind of cancel everything that's that's kind of the result of the build? And we just say, well, that has been canceled, we remove all of that. So when you cancel a pipeline, the cancellation also cascades to all the jobs there that can be canceled. And, and I think that case is like whatever has been, uh, already reported. So all the artifacts that have been already, com uh, all the jobs that have been completed, so the artifacts have been uploaded, those will be available. Uh, so even if you want to go in the UI and, down and, and have a look at them, you will be uh, able to see. Um, there is, they, they might not always be available because they, um, yeah, I guess if the job is passed and the, and the artifacts have been uploaded, those will be available to be downloaded later on. Uh, even to say I want to get the, the most uh, recent artifact uh, with this name, you should be able to get it. Uh, but yeah, the, the cancellation is more an interruption of whatever is currently being running or whatever hasn't been run, uh, just cancel them. Uh, and I hope I'm correct on what I'm saying, but uh, I'm not saying that. Cool. Thank you. So basically what you were saying, so when you cancel a pipeline, the process pipeline service, uh, well, it's actually a different service, but it will transition everything uh, into a, a cancel uh, stage. But the process pipeline service, again, will pick up the status change and, and see basically what, what else can be done. So in that case, uh, they cancel the pipeline and, uh, and there's nothing else to do. Is there something that you would have expected to see but is not here? Looks really good to me. Even a question for other people that were aware of, of this architecture overview? Um, I think maybe like the pipeline triggers, I think some of them are like kind of tightly could be tightly grouped um but then again it wouldn't be so self-explanatory for instance like i don't know like on the back end how it's handled but like um like you can schedule pipelines on the front end you know like it could be you know tied with the web ui uh different things like that or edit ci cd settings could be tied with the web ui too as a, as a pipeline trigger but i think it makes more sense to kind of have them broken apart to say like hey these are like web ui could be all of these grouped together so maybe we should maybe think about how to reorganize the pipeline triggers i don't know maybe like have a a parent 
uh, and then like kind of like go down and show like the different web UI triggers? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, for example, another thing could be grouped is the git push uh, with the merge request creating update. So those are, the merge request being updated is a consequence of the git push. But I just want to mention as a different um, trigger to distinguish from a git push to a remote branch without a merge request with a git push in the context of a merge request. Uh, but those are, uh, are these two are uh, linked together. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I, I did extend this for 245 minutes, but I'm happy to finish early if there's no more question. I mean, I, I do have another question, but I don't know if it fit into the scope of this. Um, it's more about my poor understanding of runners. <laughs> Um, and so one of the things that's always kind of um, kind of tricking me is how do we how does the communication is handled and how how does the how could I explain it like when I when I let's say develop something locally and I wanna and I, I register my runner and then I queue something um, I will sometimes see like the job being created in the CI side but it's not picked up by the runner even though it's registered. And I know it's not a, like it's not a bug because I've I did talk through with like the runner group and I, I kind of got an explanation. But I'm wondering how do how do we determine that a job has been queued, and is there, is the responsibility on the runner or on the CI side to like like I, I think like the CI sends like it said hey here's a job and you should pick it up and then the runner should do it. But on the CI side, do we have a confirmation that it's been picked up or is it just like? sending it and not caring what happened after until it receives like the, the finished state. Yeah, My so be very, very vague. So uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I get your question. So the, so between the runner and the API gateway here, there's actually another layer, which is the uh, GitLab workhorse. Um, you can consider that like a load balancer. Now basically the workhorse will intercept any connection coming from the runner to the rail site. And, and we use uh, e tags to, um, to basically uh, return immediately uh, from a request from the runner if there is no, no jobs. Um, so this is we can consider a little bit more like a caching state. So the runner contacts and the server returns back immediately to say there's no more, there's no job at the moment. But when we queue a job, we, we do something like uh, uh, we, tick the queue for the runner. So in a way, we kind of open the gate for jobs that uh, can match specific, uh, for, for runners that can match specific jobs. And this allows then the runners to reach into Rails uh, backend and, and ask for us. So uh, I'm not sure what is exactly there that might happen when, so either we don't tick the, the queue and we don't open this gate, like in, the, in terms of the metaphor, uh, and then the runner keeps requesting the for, for a new job and it simply returns back immediately um, and with a status saying there is the, by the uh, workhorse saying there is no job at the moment. And this way you might see this this lag. And I think there is a, a, it's more like a time frame. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, has anybody else seen the same behavior? I mean, look. Like like you said, it's not, so because it's two systems, it's two different systems, the runner system and the web app, um, it's not, the code execution is not linear. Like you're not gonna see when you create a job, you're, it's not, the code is not gonna linearly transition into being executed. Uh, and there's a lot of factors, like the runner system might just be, um, so what, I, we don't actually contact runners themselves directly. There's another thing. We use um, uh, a runner machine, a Docker machine, basically a runner uh, orchestrator. Um, I think it's called a runner manager, I think. Um, so basically that basically creates new runners dynamically if the load requires that. So the lag you're perceiving might be the runner manager creating a new runner and then the new runner needs to pick up the job. It also might be something else. It might, there might be a, 
uh, several, um, I don't know. Um, basically, there it might just be something that we don't control, like load on, on a specific machine. The Rails web app might be responding like to a certain request uh, slower, but also what Fabio said, um, there might be something in the workhorse. There are just so many different parts and it's just um, stability as we perceive it in that section is that within a, a relatively small, rel relatively small time frame, they're going to sync up. So it's not going to be instant. We're not trying to make it like less than 200 milliseconds, less than 300 milliseconds. As long as it syncs up eventually, we're fine. Um, I don't have an exact explanation, but yeah, what Fabio said is completely true. It might be something else. It's just, we never really gave much investigation into like what, what, like what composes that time frame because it was never this so large enough that it's considered disruptive. So we actually do have a bunch of metrics in the Grafana and Prometheus that uh, we use to measure how much time it takes for runners to pick up their builds eventually. And uh, it, of course, on GitLab.com it differs because of the load. But locally, this should be instant. And if you have a local GDK or GCK with a runner installed, if a runner is not going to pick a build within like a second or two, that it means that probably some part of your GDK is not working properly. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, I had a question actually about, you know, given this architecture, where have we, um, if there's a pattern of where we've maybe seen bottlenecks in the past when we, let's say, have uh, thousands of concurrent uh, pipelines um, being fired. And actually, a further question I wanted to ask was if there are any specific SLAs we have on GitLab.com with any particular pieces of this architecture? Mm, I don't have the numbers. Do you have any numbers? So you can point I, me to... I, I don't have numbers, but we do have a ton of alerts around yeah. the entire system. And the, most of the alerts uh, are based on the metrics we have in Grafana in the dashboard called CI Runners, I think. Mm -hmm. And our infrastructure team is the team that actually uh, is working on the alerting. And... Uh, I think it was a runner team that introduced the most of the metrics we have right now, but of course we don't have enough probably, and we also do not have enough alerting. And uh, what I, I hope that we are going to change is that basically when some kind of an alert fires, like for example, we have uh, went above the threshold, threshold of uh, GitLab runners waiting for builds, and there, there, is, there are some numbers defined somewhere, I don't even remember where. The alerts are going to be sent in Slack in the production channel, I think, uh, and uh, CI team members are not going to see them probably. And uh, that's something that is interesting, and perhaps we could actually gain some visibility into what's happening in the CI channel at least. Does it answer your question, Sharon? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I was just more around, curious more around the visibility and also where I might find them. But yeah, that makes sense that, you know, they're already tied to alerts and a lot of that's Grafana, so. Yeah, Grafana, you should see some updates uh, graphs specifically for, for CI. Cool. But overall, it sounds like we would, you know, the, the system is, is, you know, essentially this scaled to load pretty well, so. Yeah, so most of the, uh, let's say, aside from the register job service, um, the other processes here that we see the other services, they're all run uh, in, in background jobs. And so there's only some uh, exception where the create pipeline service actually done synchronously with a user request. That would be, for example, if you create a pipeline from, from the web UI. Um, but in most other cases, like git push, or if you want to, like when a merge request has been um, generated, most of the time, these are actually a trigger, uh, the, the schedule, for example. So uh, 
background workers. So really psychic uh, infrastructure is what we rely on a lot on CI. Uh, so um, I, on follow up on that, like we have an issue currently open where pipeline schedule, because we, in the UI, we predefine like the same time. So everything's at four in the morning, uh, for example, for every day. So there's a, there's a spike at that moment and we've seen like a, like a slowdown. Is this then the registered job service that's slowing everything down since you said everything else is in background job or is it like a create pipeline service that, that's staggering? So the, it's a bit of everything. So when the create pipe, pipeline, um, so the schedule basically triggers at 4 a.m. So we have a lot of pipelines being created. Um, they can all have different sort of um, uh, problems they might introduce, like when, when we have a lot of concurrent uh, services running at the same time. Um, some pipeline creation might be heavier than other ones, like especially if you are including like external files, they might be like heavier or if you are including a lot of files. Um, but then the, there is, the main problem we are seeing in that specific scenario, the 4 a.m. spike, I, I think it's related really to the runner side. So the pipeline is created, is processed, so all the jobs transition into pending state. But because there's a lot of jobs in the pending state uh, across the entire instance uh, at 4 a.m., so we have a lot of runners there. The, the runners that we have, that they don't keep up with the number of jobs. So that's why we see queue time increasing for jobs. But these are queue times for the runners. Uh, if that's why there's a kind of discussion whether we could have some sort of auto scaler prior to 4, 4 a.m. where we can let's say double the number of runners for half an hour and, and then reduce back. That will solve the problem. So, um, but once that's the problem is solved, there might be maybe other sort of performance uh, issues that are become more like relevant, for example, on the create pipeline service uh, might be, but the, right now the big hitter is the, the, the fact that we don't have enough runners for 4 a.m. Especially if that 4 a.m. also matches with uh, uh, the first of the week of the, and the first of the month. So then the kind of means it merges all the possible uh, schedules they can find on, on, on current job, the default ones. So actually, we do have auto scaling enabled on GitLab.com. However, it could be probably a little bit more efficient, and sometimes we are not able to process the, the spike in, in builds. But yeah, it's, it's not as fast. Yeah, yeah it, it's there. Awesome, thank you. Cool. I think we are at the time now, and uh, thank you all for for this. And I will put this in a, on a. On a documentation page. I'll probably add some sort of uh, transcript of this walk, uh, walkthrough on the documentation so anybody can look at this asynchronously and we can also add any more details as, as we feel like. So um, if there is any more question, then we can uh, continue adding on the Slack channel. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.